Hi, I'm Tim Lynch. I am a media librarian at the Morristown and Morris Township Library. I have been volunteered uh, to display hidden talents and I my college degree is in fine arts. I went to the School of Visual Arts in New York and, and studied painting. And one of the things we did there was to copy old master paintings. And uh, we replicated them, usually in acrylic paints, even though they were in oil paints. So I'm going to try and do that today. We have uh, chosen a particular painting that I'm fond of, and it's uh, attributed to Rembrandt. And it is Young Woman at Half Open Door. Now, Rembrandt, of course, was one of the most famous artists who ever lived. His, his name come, 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 sir, is uh, associated with art, the same way Van Gogh is and Picasso is, just a huge giant in art. And he, he did a number of self-portraits. He was famous for that. He really had, besides his quality of his painting, it's just the psychological depth that he used when when he examined his subjects and he examined himself. He was famous for self-portraits and they're all through his uh, life from the time he was a very young man until just before he died. There's Here he is as an old man. I did see the painting in the flesh, or in the oil for that matter. It uh, is held in the uh, Art Institute of Chicago and I saw that several years ago. Here's her, the signature of Rembrandt in 1645. So this lady was born probably over 400 years ago. Uh, she's wearing the simple brown uh, Dutch woman's uh, clothes, but the one decoration on her is um, a uh, red necklace, which is a bit of a, a bit of a luxury at that time. She is looking off to the side, even though she is facing the um, viewer, and that's unusual for paintings at that time. A portrait would uh, would have the uh, subject looking directly at the viewer, at the audience, engaging them. But she's looking off to the side kind of thoughtfully. She has a half smile on her fa uh, face, so it's uh, what it, she's looking at something. We don't know what it is. Could it be a friend? Could it be a uh, lover? Could that be what the necklace is for? Uh, there is just a little bit of mystery in this, uh, in what she is looking at, and that perhaps makes her even all the more engaging. These are the paints that I'm going to use, and you can come in and take a look at these. Guys, this is acrylic paint. Uh, Rembrandt at the, and uh, all the Dutch painters at that time used oil paint, which was, they got their own pigments and clays, and then they would grind them and mix them with linseed oil. Uh, and that is oil color, and then when it hardened, it would make a fine uh, waterproof uh, seal. Uh, in, the, uh, in the 1850s, uh, they started make, uh, manufacturing artist paints and putting them in tin tubes, and so the artist no longer had to grind his own paint, and, uh, and so it became a much more standardized uh, kind of process. Uh, in the 18, uh, ni sorry, 1930s they st and 40s, they started c developing uh, acrylic paint, which is a plastic-based paint. And this is what I'm using here. It's, uh, it's just, you just have to thin it with water. It's odorless, unlike oil paint. And um, it is pretty versatile because you can take um, uh, acrylic paint and you can smear it down, and almost like it's a spackle or like a toothpaste, and you can smear it onto... Uh, onto a painting um, very thickly. Or you can use water and thin it down uh, to it's, till it's like a very thin sort of watercolory kind of th uh, thing. And you can use it both ways, either thick or thin. And we'll be using in that in both ways in the painting we're going to use. The, paint, the colors I'm using are just seven colors, um, you, which is black and black and white and hooker's green which is a dark transparent green a uh, scarlet red uh, burnt sienna which is a um, uh, a reddish brown uh, burnt umber which is a dark brown and yellow ochre which is sort of a uh, 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 
a golden yellowish, uh, brownish yellow. And these are colors that Rembrandt would use. He didn't use much blue because blues uh, were very expensive uh, at that time in a Amsterdam. It was very difficult to come by, and they were very expensive. So for the, so Rembrandt you, was uh, versatile enough to use different colors and even sometimes give the effect of, of blue. We can discuss that later. Without the effect of blue, without actually using blue, hmm. and or green. So I'm going to start using. This is a canvas board. It's been primed with gesso, which is a, a mixture of chalk. And, um, and plastic to give a white background. Now, the artist at that time usually didn't work on a pure white background. They often had a tone back, worked on a tone background of a middle gray brown. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm going to start adding brown. I'm going to spray this with a little water from a spray bottle. I've got brushes in water here. And I'm going to thinning this down into a water, watercolor consistency, and I'm going to just spread this all over this um, this canvas. Canvas board, actually. And it takes a little while to do that. And when it's done. It's going to look something like that. You see, it is it doesn't have? It's pretty rough, unevenly, but it's dry now and it's ready to be uh, painted on. While the canvas board is drying, I want to analyze the picture a little uh, and analyze the forms and stuff. When you see a picture like that and the way the picture is structured, it's pretty straightforward. In, in in this case, but like a lot of pictures, it does have a structure and it does have a, have a rhythm to it. And pictures have rhythms and um, rhymes and echoes, just like a song or a poem or uh, does. And in this case, the shapes we've got the rectangle, which centers the pic uh, her her form, and uh, her dress. It's a matter of curves here. So this this area gets. This is one curve, and then that is echoed by this curve here, and then her headdress here. So these curves create a rhythm, and then there's a counter rhythm. A ca the counter rhythm is her neck, her necklace, and then the shape of her head and her column create a counter rhythm. The interest in the picture, of course, is the her face. It's right there. It's right in the center there. This picture here, this uh, this photocopy is too dark, but it does center in just to where the uh, uh, where the interest is. It's in her face, it's in her column, and then in her left hand. There's a bit of light behind her, and that's. That's about it. Her other hand, her right hand, is in shadow. It doesn't become, you're, we're aware of it, but we're, we're not so much interested in it. Just this hand anchoring her to the door, and then this face. This creates a pull here. And then just um, this negative space here. Uh, pictures have positive space and negative space. In this case, the light behind it creates interest here. It creates light that's coming to her, or behind, and also this space here, this wedge from her arm and against her dress is about the same size and sort of like the inverse of the shape of the hand. So this this is a rhyme here, like, in, like I said, like in a poem or in a song, it creates a rhythm here. I've measured it a little bit now with some inches just so I know approximately where it's going to go on my canvas board. My canvas board is almost twice the size as this picture. And so I've tried to measure it out. I'm not good with math, so I hope it will uh, work out. But mostly I will be doing free hands work on it. Okay, now I'm um, going to draw in the frames of the door for 
the lady and then start filling out her figure in that. And I, you can use different methods. Uh, you can use chalk or pencil. I used to like to use charcoal because it's easy to correct. If I make a bad mark, I can just rub it with my hand. And now, a lot of people say I can't draw a straight line. Well, neither can I. I can't draw a straight line, but I do have a T-square here that's going to help me draw these straight lines. So at using this before, I had measured out some areas, and this is not exact. Um, this is not an exact measurement, but it, it'll serve our purposes. So, our square, I'm going to prop that up. That's the door frame. This is the open door. Note the markers that he used. He put little notches to represent the spacing that he worked out on that sheet you saw. Thank you, noble assistant. And now, there's the goat. It's the ghost of Rembrandt who's helping us today. And, okay. So, there I have these measured out, and now I'm going to be drawing my figure in. Here we are in the uh, nature in the raw here, and uh, I'm going to start using a piece of charcoal, or just charcoal, and I'm going to try and sketch the uh, form of the figure and see if, it, if the wind will allow me to start. It's tedious to watch someone draw in real time. So uh, at this point, um, I will just speed up the, um, uh, the motion here. This is just establishing the shapes, laying down basic shapes and the basic structure and forms in the right locations. Not getting too detailed, but just getting uh, uh, in the primitive way, trying to get the uh, art and smudging areas to correct them. I wish I could draw this fast. Okay, I've uh, been working on the picture some more and trying to correct the issues with the um, uh, proportions of the uh, arms and the head and the hands and it's getting a little bit better as again I'm the charcoal can be erased all that smudging will eventually be removed when we start painting it stepping back and looking at the picture and looking at the proportions you'll see how you can establish the proportions if it's looking okay and this is far from perfect but a lot of the stuff is going to be corrected in the um, actual layering of paint so uh, I think we're going to we're ready to add the paint. So uh, gotta go feed the cat. Yeah, well, I when I paint, I like to hear a little music or something like that. And so, Maestro, if you could, we have to speed up the painting process again so it doesn't look uh, so it doesn't try our patience as much. Uh, I wish I could paint this fast, but I can barely paint and chew gum at the same time and I wish I had some gum so using a mixture of black and burnt umber to uh, build up uh, the lines and do a little preliminary shading okay we're back here and I'm going to paint a little more area this is black burnt umber and a little white and we want to just get it very dark up in this area here it will get darker as the painting progresses but it should be like a luminous dark and again we're going to try and blending it blending it and as it got further gets further down the picture we'll mix be mixing it with more and more white
mixing in the white and also as you're doing this refining some of the uh, outlines of the drawing adding a little white to the uh, to the collar and to the headdress once we have this uh, I'm ready getting ready to uh, start with the uh, facial areas and so I want to talk a little bit about uh, how to construct the head and the face. Okay, well, um, before I paint it, I want to analyze the head and face area a little bit, and um, I examine how it is constructed. And uh, right now we have some uh, a squatter's rights issue, but I think I'm just going to have to ask my friend here to, here we go. Now we're going to look at um, the lady's head and heads are constructed usually egg-shaped and from the top of her head to the chin I'm trying to go right down the middle of it it's got a little curve her head is tilted ever so slightly and we just go down the middle and that is that is her that's the middle of her head more or less now in the halfway point between the chin and the top of the head is they cut that into quarters and this is usually where the eyes are in most people then halfway between the eyes and the chin is where the bottom of the nose is halfway between the bottom of the nose and the chin is where the uh, mouth is and the lips are on either side and then halfway between the lips and the chin uh, the bottom of the chin is where usually the chin begins. Again, we are being interrupted. Excuse me for a second. Everybody's a crick. So, just remembering this structure when, when you paint most uh, or draw most heads uh, and faces is very helpful. Uh, and just remember uh, the head, if you think of the head as a flat sphere, like an egg, or oval, like an egg, then you have to remember that it has uh, protuberances and, and the areas that recede. It has got hills and valleys. Her forehead is going to protrude a little bit and then it's going to recede in, for the bridge of the nose, then protrude again to the outside of the head. Then there's a big jump and there'll usually be a big cast shadow from the nose down into this area of the mouth just above the mouth. The lips are protrusions again, then another recession. That's where the uh, chin begins. So there's a recession, then the chin protrudes. So when you're trying to get that, you're trying to make it look not flat, but the curves and protrusions and uh, recessions and valleys in the head. Same thing going around the cheek is going to protrude a little bit, then the nose is going to come out, then the head is going to protrude. Remember also, her head recedes into the shadows. So we're going to try and suggest the outside shadowy part of the head without getting too, uh, with too, uh, getting too specific or definite about that. And also just remember that the ear is between the nose the area of the nose and the eye. Well, now, uh, using the ideas we've mentioned in how to indicate the face, I'm drawing with the brush, with the burnt dumper, and when I've got a reasonable likeness, we can start filling in the flesh tones. Uh, apologize that we got a lot of my back of my hand in this section, but you'll just have to take my word that I am drawing that drawing that face. We'll try and correct that later. Anyway, there we are. And now we're filling in the uh, flesh tones with a mix of white and uh, burnt sienna, a little black for the cooler, grayer areas. And uh, use, using the, um, the tone, the brown tone of the um, uh, canvas board, is using that to serve as our shadows 
and that will be important later. Uh, and while we're doing this, probably should start mentioning about the man who's pro responsible for the painting is um, uh, whose real full, full name is Rembrandt Harmenzoon van Rijn, who was born. 1606, a time when Shakespeare was writing his plays in England, and uh, th there were still uh, the English and the Dutch, the Spanish, the French were all starting to uh, bring all the riches from the Americas to Europe. And uh, Rembrandt was born in Leiden, in Holland. And the legend has that he was a uh, dirt poor, illiterate peasant type, but he wasn't that at all. I'll just go back to the picture. Notice that I'm starting to get refining things. I'm starting to add a little bit of the red into the mix to get indicate pink. We've got our eyes going in. You're starting to try and get a resemblance uh, of a likeness. And it this takes a while to get it in going oh uh, well, anyway Rembrandt was not a peasant uh, a dirt poor peasant his he, his family was a middle-class family his father was uh, well to fairly well to do he was part owner of a mill a windmill and the mills were always busy grinding grain for flour grinding stones for minerals and it was uh, he was a pretty good did a pretty good business okay now we're starting to add a little more brown using the finger can just wipe in it make areas more indistinct you just want to blend areas and trying to get just starting to get it more and more resembling human the human flesh of a of a dutch dutch person over there and uh, I want to start working on the hands. We'll do that in a second. Uh, Rembrandt's brothers were all apprenticed to uh, other millers, cobblers, bakers, well, different craftsmen. But Rembrandt, who was the youngest of nine children, showed himself to be a clever young man. And so his uh, parents recognized that, and they raised enough money to send him to the university. Uh, and got a uh, when he was in his early teens, and he got a, a classical education. And he was in, uh, enrolled, probably to be an important person, perhaps a, a clergyman or a or a lawyer, or a judge, and such. But he asked his parents to um, eventually got the painting bug and he asked his parents to be apprenticed to a painter which they did apprentice him and um, he and he uh, was, was apprenticed to a local painter did very successfully and uh, started his own studio when he was a young man only about 20 years old did very well for himself in Leiden and so much so that he went decided to go to the big city in Holland, which was Amsterdam. Now we've just got the indicated the uh, hands with flesh, and now using the dark black and umber outlining areas, adding in shadows, uh, working on the dress, giving more wrinkles to the dress and to uh, to the wooden door start working on the bodice over here of her, of her dress we've got these lines and she's got these little uh, uh, hooks little holes snaps for her um, for the laces of her bodice so we'll start adding those in I often will put in like an indicate a color I want these to stand out but I am going to tone them down uh, later so you'll just hit the highlights of them as we'll do that later so anyway 
uh, he had shown him, uh, Rembrandt in his early 20s, had shown himself to be a good enough to have his own studio and produced paintings of uh, religious themes and mythological themes. And he also made uh, etchings on copper plates, sketches of himself, of everyday life. He was, and this, but he was particularly um, good at portraits. And by that time of uh, moving to the big city in Amsterdam, the previous painters, they had to, when they did portraits, they were doing portraits of uh, the rich clergy um, or the uh, royal royalty. But at this time, what Rembrandt was doing was he was doing the business class. Uh, there were, as I said, you know, Amsterdam's like a trades town, and uh, there were wealthy merchants and businessmen looking, looking for um, an artist to do portraits of them, make, looking and they looking very, very prosperous. It was especially admired by uh, for his ability to paint them in fancy dress with lace and and their ruffles and and, and such. Music we're listening to, by the way, is Schubert, who was in the early 18, and 1800s, about hmm, not quite 200 years after Rembrandt, but I think he works well. I think Rembrandt and Schubert work well together. It's the Trout Quartet. Qu pardon me, Quintet by Schubert. Anyway, uh... Rembrandt developed a very smooth technique, but he had a sharp sense of character, of people, and how to and knew how to present a picture just of a bunch of people with, or a single person with a certain amount of drama, and psychological insight, using uh, using the shadows, and using a limited again a limited palette, only using browns, whites, blacks, creams, a little red. People who were very pop again, he was a popular man, like the, uh, for group portraits, like the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp, which presented doctors of Amsterdam. So I'm adding now, checking the picture, our original picture a lot, painting in now the, uh, using black, using the, uh, painting in the necklace. And using washes to darken in areas, as I said, there's the bodice area is now darkened in. The lighter areas have just mixed uh, gray and white, I mean black and white, and a little bit of the yellow ochre to give it a greenish quality. Now I'm just using the cadmium red, the scarlet red, to add in the beads of the necklace. Now, Rembrandt, once he was in Amsterdam, he all, he was very successful. He also did what they call marrying up. He married a, uh, a wealthy uh, family's uh, daughter, daughter of a burgermeister, and her name was Saskia. And she, uh, her money, her family's money helped, helped him establish a studio and buy a big house in Amsterdam. And Rembrandt was also a collector of uh, he enjoyed collecting costumes and uh, odd uh, things but gold coins suits of armor um, seashells stuffed animals things he gave himself an old, uh, his own private little museum and he used those those uh, sometimes those items as props now I'm just adding some white and gray to the collar area to get the late, uh, stiff lace collar to the young lady there. And again, just the whiter areas are the ones that are built up more. The, uh, the darker areas are left kind of sketchy and we're use, uh, using the uh, 
canvas, the dark canvas to do work as shadow. And occasionally using the white to highlight areas like around her forehead and her cheek. Those are the areas that uh, would catch the light. Those are the protruber, uh, the areas that protrude, so the nose and the forehead and the chin would be catching the light in her ear. Uh, notice her eyes, the white of her eyes are gray on that because people, they call them the whites of their eyes, but they're not really not white. They're usually gray or yellow, bluish sometimes in some people. Let's add some hair to the young lady. She has very nice hair in the drawing uh, because it was a mix of brown and blonde and some reddish in there too as well. Anyway, he, Rembrandt was married to a, 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 a pretty young lady named Saskia, and he, he truly seemed to love her. They had four children. Only the youngest one, the son Titus, survived. The rest died in infancy, and poor Saskia herself died young as well. She was only 30, and then left to Be uh, Beethoven, left to Rembrandt, uh, rather bereft so women in his port portraits often had sort of reflected her her image her memory but we don't think this is Saskia at all this was painted at uh, some years after Saskia passed away so we'll get back and we'll get to that uh, at a later time well, well, not do it now. Is that uh, after Saskia, uh, Rembrandt started an affair with uh, his young son's Titus's nanny, and her name was Yirt. Yirt uh, lived with him as a sort of a common law wife, and and they were ha seemed to be happy for uh, several years. And this could possibly be a portrait of uh, Gier, or influenced by her. Again, uh, I, again, I will get back to uh, back to that. Unfortunately, they had a falling out of it, uh, and a new maid, housemaid, was in the came to the Rembrandt household named Hendrika, and Rembrandt uh, fell in love with Hendrika, and she became his model in his later paintings. Now just adding, um, let's attack, now we've got the face, the collar, the necklace, and dress. Just start adding the background. And then just, just gray and white, just black and white. Little, perhaps a little bit of yellow in some of the warmer areas towards the bottom of the uh, lower part of the picture. So poor um, here um, sued um, uh, sued Rembrandt uh, for breach of promise, and uh, Rembrandt in turn uh, had uh, Girta committed because she became mentally uh, more and more unstable, and started stealing. Apparently, he accused her of stealing from him, or taking uh, gifts that he had given her of jewelry and such and uh, selling them off. Well, this is all rather sad, you know, a single woman, unmarried woman in Europe at that time. Didn't have too many uh, uh, alternatives to uh, for life. Okay, so we've finished with getting all the elements in the picture down in a sort of a rough manner. Some people would say this looks kind of finished to them, but this is actually just a first primitive step because now what Rembrandt would do in other painting is that he would put glazes of color on the um, top of the uh, his picture. So he has to bring it down. What we'll end up doing is bringing it back up again color-wise, but now we're going to just using a mix of the um, uh, black and burnt umber and 
some burnt sienna and, and just put a wash of color over our young lady here. Darkening everything and also unifying uh, the different colors. And again, this wasn't a limited palette. So here is our picture. We have darkened it down, put in some layers of uh, brown and uh, black on it. Lost a little bit of paint here, but we can, we'll bring that back. Now our next step is to put a varnish on it. Uh, this is gloss medium and varnish. It's an acrylic emulsifier and it is going to put, we're going to put a layer of that over the painting. I got it in our cup here. It's pretty thick stuff. I got it with a little, I watered it down a little bit to uh, make it smoother. And what this is going to do is it's going to uh, make the whole thing a bit shinier for one thing but it is also going to put a clear layer of plast plastic emulsion between the acrylic paint and then we are going to put a second coat of paint on top of this and what we are hoping to do is that the bright parts will come forward the blacker darker areas will recede and this is how Rembrandt did his paintings. He sometimes put as many as 12 or more varnishes on top of the painting. And each time he did that, he would paint, o paint over it again and clarifying the images, making it, uh, making the paint transitions subtler and refining the drawings. So I'm gonna put it out here. It dry in the sun. That's drying. I'm going to take a break. See you later.